So membrane proteins are the most important component in uh, membranes, all the various types of membranes that are in and around cells. Um, the, the, the two components of a membrane are the lipids and the proteins. The proteins essentially do all of the uh, difficult and most important tasks. Originally it was thought that these proteins, this is the Singer and Nicholson model of the membrane, are simply floating around in a sea of lipids that didn't do very much. Now it's actually known that there are positive functions for some of the lipids. They're involved in signaling and so on. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the proteins which actually carry out many, many of the individual tasks, hundreds or thousands of different tasks in the cell membrane. And so they are, each one of them, each one, each different membrane protein has a different function and carries out different uh, tasks in the membrane, transporting uh, small molecules in and out of the membrane, transporting big molecules like proteins in and out of the membrane, uh, signaling from the inside to the outside of the cell or from the outside to the inside of the cell. So they have a very important role and understanding how proteins uh, are built, their structure, and how they function in doing their different tasks is the key to understanding how membranes work and how cells work. And so when I started, I used to be um, a, stru a structural biologist interested in protein structures in generally, but about 1970 or so, um, it was clear that we didn't know very much about membrane proteins. And so that was when my own interest in this uh, area started. Um, and then um, we, we began to think about this. There were theories, um, uh, there was the um, Gorter and Grendel, there was the Singer and Nicholson models, but they were all rather generic. So the idea is to focus on specific membrane proteins, and there are thousands of them, and then find out how that particular membrane protein works and then move to the next one. And then you end up having a general picture of how all membrane proteins are built, what is their structure. And obviously the function of a membrane protein is the key thing in understanding how it interacts with the outside world. But generally structural biologists, and I am a structural biologist, we believe that if you just see the structure of something, you can look at it and you can often guess or it's often obvious how it works. Uh, in much the same way you see a car with four round wheels and it, it runs along, you kind of, you can see uh, la a large part of how it works just by looking at it. So the general philosophy of a structural biologist is find out the structure and you'll be able to either deduce or guess or have one or two hypotheses that you can test by the function. So therefore, structure we think is the key to understanding membrane proteins and that, those are the key to understanding membranes and cells. So uh, when I started, it wasn't really known about uh, membrane proteins. Nothing was really known, but there were non-membrane protein structures. That would be like enzymes or hemoglobin the oxygen carrier in the blood, and uh, the two features that are the building blocks of proteins in general were first worked out by Linus Pauling, uh, who had a Nobel Prize um, for this and other work to do with um, uh, the structure of, of, of molecules. But he, in the 1950s, Pauling and Corey, came up with uh, a model building exercise that uh, allowed them to speculate, and at that stage it wasn't proved, that, um, that all proteins would have uh, secondary structure elements. That means that the polypeptide chain, that means the chain of amino acids that make up the proteins, would be arranged in three dimensions in a particular way. And there are two, uh, there are two hypotheses that turned out to be correct were what they called the alpha helix, which was a helical arrangement of the, poly, the continuous polypeptide chain, in which there were 3.6 amino acid residues per turn of the helix. And the other structure was a beta structure, where the strands were fully stretched out, not in a helix, and then they would go along, and then the, the next strand would come back, either in an anti-parallel or a parallel uh, beta structure. And it turned out, uh, this was their hypothesis, um, that 
Soon after this, the structure of myoglobin was solved experimentally but using X-ray diffraction, and it was shown to be composed entirely of alpha helical stretches, exactly the Pauling alpha helix, with a heme group, which is the, the red oxygen binding pigment in the center of it. A little bit later, uh, other structures came along, lysozyme, chymotrypsin, and now there are 100,000 uh, sets of coordinates deposited in the protein data bank with, with tens of thousands of different protein structures. And they all have alpha helices and beta sheets in them. Um, and that's all of proteins. Um, membrane proteins in the 70s weren't known, so um, many people were wondering how it would be. Um, and in a membrane, you have this lipid bilayer where it's a hydrophobic uh, barrier between the inside and the outside of the cell. So you have to get protein molecules either on the lipid or but particularly extending through the lipids, transmembrane proteins. And so uh, one idea was uh, that you cannot have um, the parts of the protein that need to interact with water interacting with the lipid bilayer. So that means that uh, in, a, in a protein molecule you have a polypeptide chain. There are uh, components of the polypeptide that must be um, solvated by water. So you have a peptide bond. You have an NH group, that's a, a amido group, and you have a carbonyl group. Uh, so you have the peptide bond with NHCO, and these are the two um, moieties that uh, are involved in Pauling's alpha helix and beta sheet. So if you have a beta sheet, all the hydrogen bonds are satisfied inside the beta sheet. If you have an alpha helix, all these hydrogen bonds between the NH and the CO are in the alpha helix. So it was a reasonable hypothesis, and I certainly had a, a review in 1980 uh, in a meeting in the Alps where we said all membrane proteins will be either composed of a bundle of alpha helix uh, stretches of the polypeptide crossing the, uh, the, the lipid bilayer one times, two times, three times, n times, or there would be beta structure. And the only way to remove all the hydrogen bonding was to have a beta barrel. And there were beta barrels, for example, chymotrypsin, a soluble enzyme, had, was composed of two six-stranded beta barrels. So the hypothesis was that you would have either uh, membrane proteins made up of alpha helices or membrane proteins made up of beta barrels. And with time now, we now have the structure of thousands of membrane proteins. And almost all of them consist of a transmembrane alpha helical bundle or a beta barrel. Occasionally, there'll be a beta barrel with one alpha helix going through the middle, or there will be um, a beta barrel with helices on the outside. But generally speaking, the uh, the overall idea that they're either transmembrane helices or transmembrane beta barrels holds. Most of the membrane proteins in the outer membranes of bacteria, mitochondria and chloroplasts have this beta barrel structure. And most of the membrane proteins in the inner membranes, which includes nuclear membrane, endoplasmic reticulum and so on, are composed of alpha helical bundle proteins. So there is a, there is a sort of general understanding now of what to expect in different parts of the membranes in the different uh, organelles. And it fits with earlier, let's say, uh, fundamental theories, the, the Pauling helix and, and beta sheet, how they'll fit into the membrane. But then, uh, with time, uh, a lot more information has come about individual membrane proteins, usually from one person or one group of scientists focusing on specific membrane proteins. And the one that, uh, that I focused on when I was a young scientist, uh, we began by saying the most interesting membrane proteins might be, for example, in humans, the ion channels. So um, when you um, have muscles and um, nerves, they conduct uh, a nerve impulse from one end to the other. And the way they do this uh, was worked out by Hodgkin and Huxley when they analyzed sodium and potassium ion fluxes in and out of the, the membranes. And they, they didn't know what it was, but they said, when a nerve impulse passes, either in nerve or muscle, first, 
channels open that are permeable to sodium ions. They then flow from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. The cell voltage drops from 60 or 70 millivolts, negative inside, to zero. And then that opens other channels and you get a nerve impulse propagating. And then the recovery happens when the sodium channels close and then potassium channels open and then the, the membrane, they flow back and the membrane protein goes back to resting. So I thought these were very important membrane proteins and, and they still are and people still, are, still work on them. But in the 70s, they were too difficult to work on. So we looked around for simpler membrane proteins that were more um, stable, uh, easier to work on. And the one that I focused on for about 10 or 15 years was bacteria rhodopsin, which turned out to be a membrane protein with seven transmembrane helices, exactly the kind of alpha helical bundle that would be consistent with the Pauling um, alpha helix. And we found it out, that structure, first at low resolution in 1975 and then at high resolution in 1990. Another um, membrane protein that had a lot of impact in the early years was from the work of Hartmut Mikkel, who is a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Martinsried in Germany. And he focused on the reaction centers, which is the uh, the, the site at which light energy, after being captured in chloroplast, is funneled down and converted into an ion gradient across the membrane. He crystallized this complex of four proteins in 1983, and the crystals were uh, beautifully behaved, beautifully organized. And he and Hans Diesenhofer uh, solved the structure, published in 1985 and so on. And this also consisted of a bundle of... Uh, I think it was 11 transmembrane helices. So the L and the M subunits each had five uh, helices surrounding um, chlorophyll at the reaction centers and involved in light capture. And then one other transmembrane helices. So bacteriodopsin had seven transmembrane helices. The reaction centers had 11. And so that set the scene throughout the mid 80s. And then soon after that, Michael Garavito, who had been working with uh, your Rosenbusch in Switzerland, they determined the very first structure of an, a, a bacterial outer membrane protein. And that turned out to, be, to consist of a beta barrel of, uh, I think, 16 strands of beta barrel. So by 1990 or 1991, we had uh, two or three examples of membrane proteins that were either uh, transmembrane alpha helical bundles or beta barrels, thus uh, giving in great detail a picture of the structure, the general uh, type of which had been hypothesized before. And then throughout the 90s and 2000 and so on, the methods improved. Uh, some structures were determined by electron cryomicroscopy, which was our original area of interest. Others were determined by making 3D crystals and doing X-ray crystallographic analyses of the structure. And then there were other uh, powerful methods that were added in. For example, cubic lipidic phase was a particular trick for making membrane proteins crystallize in three dimensions. And now many of these structures are done by that method. Um, and then most recently, um, the electron cryomicroscopy method has been improved technically by better microscopes and detectors. And now you can determine structures of uh, membrane proteins and other proteins without ever making a crystal, without doing electron crystallography, without doing X-ray crystallography. And so now there are increasing numbers of quite important membrane protein structures being determined by these newer methods. And so now we have a situation where in the protein data bank, which is the depository, for all the protein structures and nucleic acid structures and ribonucleoprotein structures, all the different proteins in bio, uh, structures in biology, uh, there are now 100,000 of these deposited. Uh, you know, it would take you a long time just to look at them all. Um, and of these 100,000, probably a few thousand are membrane protein structures. So still, we may have a knowledge of perhaps the three-dimensional structures of half the proteins in the world, either uh, 
as a 3D image of the structure itself or some related similar homologous structure. In summary then, we now have a knowledge, uh, having started with nothing, we now have a knowledge of thousands of different membrane protein structures. Uh, beta barrel structures, alpha helical structures, and then there are a few that are hybrids of the two. And then there's just the occasional special membrane protein. For example, aquaporin, which has a function of allowing water molecules to pass through all cells, but particularly in the red blood cell, controls the size and osmotic pressure. That has a very special arrangement of the polypeptide where it one of the strands of the protein goes in and turns around halfway through the membrane and comes back, and a similar one from the other side. So there are perhaps a very small number of ultra-special uh, membrane proteins that do not fit into these categories, and that's because they have a particular function. So I would say now we have an, a really excellent idea about membrane protein structure, and this uh, knowledge permeates the thinking of all the people in biology who are studying uh, different aspects of biology.